and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I have a returning guest and I am talking to Katie Beecher, who is a medical and spiritual intuitive and licensed professional counsellor. Katie is featured by numerous media outlets, including, I'm going to say this wrong, Poosh, Miranda Kerr's Cora Organics, and Goop, as in Gwyneth Goop, who calls her readings eerily accurate. Katie is based in the U.S. And as part of her acclaimed readings, she creates a detailed multi-page report, an intuitive soul painting, knowing only a person's name and age. And she has over 30 years of experience helping people all over the world transform their lives and their health. I don't know if you've heard of a medical intuitive before, but this is someone with psychic abilities who uses these abilities for greater insight into some aspect of well-being. Now, no one is suggesting that medical intuitives can replace consultations with doctors, psychiatrists, nutritionists, or any other kind of medical professional. But if you value the role of gut instinct and follow your own intuition, you probably get a sense of the incredible power in listening to this. Katie has had intuitive, empathic, and medium abilities since she was a young child, but was fearful of them until she entered therapy with a Jungian psychologist for an eating disorder at the age of 16. Extraordinarily, Katie reached out for help on her own, independently from her parents, which was a brave and bold decision. Katie found that developing bulimia and depression, although taking to her to a very, very dark place, it was one of the best things that happened to her. Through healing and therapy, Katie learned how to connect her intuition, accept and understand her intuitive and psychic gifts, and find self-love and acceptance. So the foundational healing work also inspired Katie for her later work with clients as both a therapist and medical intuitive. Katie has also written a book about her work and how others can heal and enhance their lives using the same technique she uses in her readings. It is called Heal From Within, a guidebook to intuitive wellness, And this is a fascinating insight into a different way of approaching healing. So Katie's story and work is inspiring and will offer reflections and encouraging perspectives that many of you will relate to. In the episode today, we'll be hearing about Katie's recovery story. We'll talk about the valuable work she does today with her clients as a medical and spiritual intuitive. We'll talk more about her book and we'll delve deeper into the body image issues that we all often experience whilst also reflecting on how our bodies change with ageing and how to cope with this in the youth-obsessed world. I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I love being with you. Brilliant. Yeah, well, great to have you here, Katie. And you are a returning guest, aren't you? You know, you have been on the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast, I think, about 18 months ago. Wow, that went fast. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Katie, can I firstly get you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Yes. So I am a medical and spiritual intuitive and a licensed professional counselor. I've been doing this work for about 30 years. And personally, I've been recovered from really serious bulimia and depression, again, for over 30 years. And I've been able to you know, help a lot of people. I wrote a book called Heal From Within that has my story and tons of other good stuff in there. But it was really you know, getting the eating disorder and going through the recovery process that helped change my life for the better. So it's not something that I look upon as being a negative thing. Mm. Well, thanks for sharing that, Katie, because I'm sure like a lot of people listening might be really in the very low depths of their eating disorder Mm, at the moment. But, you know, it sounds like for you, like hitting that rock bottom, it almost helps you to find your path and to sort of, you know, get on the path that you're on today, I guess. It absolutely did. And yeah, I'm not going to lie. It was from the beginning of the eating disorder till I would say like fully recovered. It was eight years and it was bad. You know, I was throwing up three times a day and using laxatives and 
diuretics and starving and basically, you know, everything, all the quote tricks we try to do, you know, looking back on it, it really feels like it was a different person, but I want people to know that they really can recover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm so with you because of, you know, I have a similar sort of story to yourself in the fact that I sort of went through quite a hellish yeah. time in my life. But yeah, absolutely. For me as well, it was, you know, finding the way out has really enabled me to sort of find myself. And I very much came to this as a wounded healer. But Katie, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I know for you, when you first, you went to therapy yourself, did you when you were 16? And that was sort of independently from your parents? Is that right? That is right. Yes, I was literally suicidal. I had a plan, you know, I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I don't know if it was, you know, getting accepted to college in another state, or I'm really not sure what led to it. But one day I came home from school and decided I was not going to do this anymore. I was not going to live like this. And I had never told anybody, but I called our pediatrician and nobody was around. I didn't tell my parents or anyone and told them what I was doing. And so he thankfully recommended a therapist in the area and her orientation was Jungian counseling for people don't know who don't know anything about Carl Jung. It was really the perfect kind of therapy for me because it was all about connecting to intuition and connecting to your body and learning self-love and acceptance and learning the underlying root causes for why I was doing what I was doing and feeling what I was feeling. And it also, he, you know, Carl Jung believed in intuitive abilities and psychic things and mediums. And so I had had all these abilities, but I, they were really scary and I didn't know what to do with them or how to connect. So it was really a total acceptance of who I was and, you know, allowed me like to objectively accept all the good and the bad and be able to find, you know, that self-love and separate from my dysfunctional family and, and all kinds of other stuff. But it was, you know, it was for me, and this is the kind of work that I do with people now in terms of young and counseling and letting my guides, you know, create reports about them and, and tell them about root causes of things. So it's still, you know, it's, it's something that I've done ever since I learned it myself. Mm. So it sounds that as though, although you didn't realize it probably at the time, that that was almost the ideal type of support that you needed that really enabled you to sort of heal in the way that was right for you. Yes, absolutely. It's funny because my daughter, she just graduated with her master's in counseling and she also used to have orthorexia. You know, thankfully I didn't give her too bad of an eating disorder, but that (laughs) can be bad. In her case, it wasn't too awful. And she, figured it out herself in high school. And we didn't, you know, we really didn't know. But anyway, she just graduated with her master's in counseling and she's working at an eating disorders clinic. You know, she tells me the stories about the people that she works with. And by rights, you know, as bad as I was, I probably would have been hospitalized, be it today. But I don't know that those methods necessarily would have been the best for me. Mm. Yeah, no, it's so interesting, isn't it? And it sounds like for you, really getting to work more with your intuition and more on that kind of root cause and looking at some of your relationships and things in your life at that time, that was all really incredibly healing rather than, you know, I think so many treatments sometimes, and I think this is sometimes necessary, but not always beneficial as the whole treatment, but we can get very focused, can't we, on symptoms you know, trying to change those symptoms. But, you know, if we're not really digging out the roots of the eating disorder or whatever it is, we can get really stuck, can't we? Yeah. And I think a lot of traditional treatment seems to be focused on, you know, behavioral modification. And there's a big element of control to it, especially if you're inpatient, people are watching what you do all the time. And I guess I, you know, I get it. That's warranted sometimes. But I learned to treat my eating disorder and my body as my friend, instead of something that I hated that was out to get me, you know, that I didn't have any control over. And you just feel like you're going to gain weight forever and can't stop. And so I learned some really amazing techniques that I, they're in my book. And when I work with people, I teach them about, you know, communicating with your body and intuition as your friend and learning what messages it's trying to tell you. 
because I really believe that all of that happened absolutely for a reason. And if I didn't change my life, I would have been dead even before I got the eating disorder because I was, you know, so depressed and everything. So I think it's important to see, maybe see it as a healing tool in your life instead of something that, you know, is evil that you have to fight against. Mm, That's a really helpful perspective. So Katie, can you say a little bit more about sort of when you are working and with a sort of client today, like how would you sort of, where would you sort of start? And yeah. I'm guessing it's quite individual to the person, but yeah, can you give us a bit of an insight? Absolutely. So I have a very unique process and I have someone's name and age and that's all I know about them. Hopefully don't see a picture, hopefully don't get any more information because the more I know, the more I can be a human instead of letting my intuitive guides work. So I take that information and I create a very, very detailed four-page report about every aspect of their life that is influencing them in any way. And that, you know, it includes physical stuff and emotional stuff, but it's also things like like trauma and their career and creativity and their relationships and Gosh, all sorts of things, because, you know, every aspect of our life impacts every other aspect. And then I also create a intuitive soul painting. So it's kind of it's an artistic representation of people's bodies and energy and symptoms. And I send that before I meet with anyone. So they have that. I can't, you know, fake it. And then when we meet, we go over everything there. We look at, you know, what are all the possible root causes for things that are making them unhappy. We also look at strengths and how they can build on those and, you know, come up with a plan for every aspect of their life to help them to feel better. You know, I also will refer to medical professionals that I trust when I pick up symptoms and because I can't legally or ethically diagnose, you know, so I work with other people, but people come out with a very complete overall picture of what's going on in their life and then how to make it better. Mm, yeah, no, it sounds such an interesting process. And you literally like to start with, you literally just have someone's name and age do you, and that's your starting point. Yeah, no, it's a little crazy. It is definitely crazy. <laughs> I don't know how I do it. And people get the reports and, you know, the first thing I always ask is, did you feel that the report was accurate? And they're like, oh my God, how did you do that? Like, you totally know me. I'm like, glad to hear it. I never want to take it for granted, you know? So I blow myself away, even though it's not really me. And then it's great to also have the experience of being a licensed counselor because really personal traumatic issues often come up that sometimes people have never told anyone. So we really, you know, get into the depths of things, but it's great because people don't have to retell their whole life story. Like, you know, when you go to your first therapy appointment and it feels like, you need to be there for like 10 appointments to tell the whole story. So, <laughs> you know, we kind of already have all that because my guides figured it out. So it's pretty cool. Mm, yeah, they're fascinating. And Katie, what's your process as well? I don't know how much you, that you can share of this, but you know, like when you have like someone's name and age, then do you like have a sort of, how do you work to like get into the space <laughs> where you are guided? <laughs> I'm very intrigued. <laughs> like how the hell do you do this? Yeah. So I start by selecting just an Oracle card. There's a, you know, a couple of decks I like, and that just helps me get me out of my own head and starts me on a little bit of a direction. I don't really have to meditate or anything before because I've just you know been doing this for so many years, but I just ask that the reading be for you know the person's highest and best good. And literally, like I have a chart that I've made up that lists all of the emotional and physical characteristics of all the chakras. So people know what they are. They don't have to have any information about them before. And then I just have these blank squares, basically, where my guides start telling me information and I will see pictures of things. I'll hear words in my head or I'll see a word or maybe I'll see a scene from somebody's life or I'll see a part of their body or inside their body. I pick up physical symptoms myself from them, sometimes smells. It's all, you know, I kind of have all the clairs. So I've learned to just go with what I hear and put it down and not question it. And then I don't always know what it means. So that's why it's really important that I go over the report and the information with the client, because 
you know, sometimes it's symbolic and we need to figure it out together. You know, I've learned not to second guess it and just kind of write things down and it'll figure itself out. Mm, yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And is it a similar to the process when you're doing the painting as well, producing the painting for your client? Yeah, yeah. So with the painting, I always do that after because it gives me additional information, but it also clarifies or confirms a lot of the information I've received. So I start with a color and these are all really different. So it's often a figure of some type, but it also could be like a flower that, you know, is made into a body or a plant or an animal or something like that. But they have me start with a color and then I kind of go down the space and Every color means something different, how it's placed on the painting, where it is on the painting. So like, for example, the fifth chakra is in the neck. So that's a lot of that is about expression. And if I were to put maybe purple in the neck, that to me is a sign that people can just trust their intuition to help them express themselves. And they don't have to like you know, overthink it and things like that. So that's a very little quick example, but, you know, wherever things are, the placement of the arms, the direction, the feet are facing, all kinds of things, you know, mean something. So I interpret it with them at the kind of at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it sounds really fascinating. And your book, Katie, so obviously that was released last February, is that right? Yep. Sure. Brilliant. So if people want to get hold of your book as well, is that sort of like a tool in a way to enable people to be able to do some of this work themselves or how does the, how can people use your book? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it's called Heal From Within. And I was told by my guides when I was recovering from the eating disorder that I was going to be writing books and helping other people through my experience, which is wonderful. The beginning is just, you know, telling kind of my story of recovery from eating disorder and Lyme and dysfunctional family stuff. And then I take people through what doing a reading with me would be like in terms of connecting to their intuition, helping them identify and prioritize their issues, and then going through each chakra, which is an energy center or parts of the body, and being able to say, wow, I have a lot of things maybe that fit into the maybe the second chakra, which is like around the hips and reproductive area. I have a lot of symptoms around that. And that could be pelvic pain or period issues. It could be, you know, sexual abuse or assault or, you know, not really identifying with male or female power. There's so much in there. But so if you find that you have a lot of symptoms in certain areas, you can focus on those. And then there are lots of tools and quizzes and just tons of information, you know, for helping you work through that. And then there's also a blank template where you can kind of create your own report based on the information that you've discovered. Mm, sure. Okay. And no, thank you for sharing. And I guess for anyone listening who maybe feels very out of touch with their intuition and maybe even a bit skeptical about being able to trust your intuition, what could be a baby step for someone to be able to, you know, take a step towards being more tuned into that and being able to listen to that kind of inner wisdom? Yeah. One of the things I would say to start with is one of the biggest obstacles is overthinking it. So people are often afraid that they're going to get it wrong or, you know, I'm not intuitive. I can't do this. I'm not a psychic, you know, kind of doubting themselves and they're afraid to make a mistake. So they're afraid they're going to screw things up. And so that's one of the biggest obstacles. But I think about intuition almost like it's a higher power or like a loving parent, a loving bodyguard, something like that, that's always with us, keeping us safe, and it knows everything about us. It's really a source of the companionship. If you connect with this loving part of yourself, then you always have this core of strength. And what other people are doing and thinking, which is a big concern with eating disorders and body image, is far less important. So the quickie version, this is all in my book, but is to practice like physically writing to your intuition or your body, write to them as your friends. And you can just say something like, do you have anything to tell me today? 
and then write down whatever you get, you know, and write back and then have a kind of a written discussion with that and see where it takes you. Mm, sure. And they're really interesting. Do you know what? I'm going to be having a go at some of these <laughs> exercises. <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> And now a quick advertisement break. Are you a burned out high achieving woman who's frustrated that emotional eating, weight gain and exhaustion are self-sabotaging your work and life? You're tired, fatigued, brain fogged, your cravings are through the roof and you feel so insecure in your body and that's impacting the way you show up in your business, career and life. Who could you be if you actually addressed your emotional eating struggles, built food freedom and made peace with your body? Free, that's what. Get support to fully overcome emotional eating, address hormone and gut issues, and build the body confidence and connection you've always desired. If you're ready to address each piece, be sure to check out Amber Romaniak, emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert with nine years of experience, helping over 1,500 women with support on all of the above, without diets, without restriction or quick fixes. She will do a full health assessment and help you get to the root of your symptoms with hormone testing, gut health, and of course, support to help your body come back to balance with your mind and soul. Visit amberapproved.ca to book a 30-minute body freedom call or check out the No Sugar Coating podcast today to learn more about the connections between our relationship with food, mindset, and our health, and how it impacts the way we show up in all areas of our lives. <laughs> just listening to what you do in you know in your job and everything like you've obviously had to you know become you know really in tune and self-trusting and almost kind of like you know letting go of like over control all the noise of the world really kind of going with that process of going within and I guess I'm wondering like how do you manage to stay consistently in that space because it is quite challenging isn't it sometimes in the world that we live in Yes, I'm over here laughing. Yes, <laughs> I think it is a gigantic challenge, even for someone who basically, you know, makes her living listening to this. I think it's very challenging to know when to step in and take action and when to sit back and allow spirit or life to take its course and to trust that things are going to be okay. You know, a lot of us eating disorder people tend to be a little bit of a control freak, you know. And maybe, you know, we haven't been able to trust the world or other people around us. So a survival mechanism has been, hey, I need to take control of my life here, you know. But I also think it's very easy to, at least for me, to put forth my own agenda, thinking things have to be this way or something bad's going to happen or, you know, living kind of fear-based. So for me, it helps to pay attention to when I'm feeling anxious and to tune into that and be like, all right, you know, am I pushing some agenda of mine that I think is supposed to happen and remembering the times when I've really pushed things and not let go and things have not worked out well, but it's always kind of being aware and like even the concept of manifesting, which is great, but sometimes you're so focused on trying to manifest something that that becomes your focus and you're not like, well, you know what, maybe that's not for my best good. And maybe I can be open to whatever other things come. I really do think it's a balance and something just to always be aware of when you're feeling anxious and if control is one of the root causes of that. Mm, yeah no so helpful to reflect on that because I think I'm sure I know I can relate to this I'm sure so many of the listeners we do have a tendency don't we to be sometimes coming from that fear-based place wanting to mm -hmm. over control and yeah and then the trouble is once you get on that sort of hamster wheel spinning really uh -huh. fast and then it's so hard isn't it to tune into your intuition because of your you're just kind of flying through life and you're kind of missing all those little signs and you haven't got time to listen to the inner voice and inner wisdom have you oh it's so true and you're really overriding it you know if you're mm. fear you can't listen because you're just blocking out everything and so much of not only eating disorder stuff but addiction in general or whatever is really like being afraid that people will see who you really are or afraid that there's something inherently wrong with you or that 
people are looking at you or, you know, whatever. And a lot of these things just aren't true. So it's really important to question your beliefs and your views and, you know, to kind of be open to trying other things, even though it's scary. Mm, Yeah, no, very true. And Katie, are you quite unique as a medical and spiritual intuitive? Because, you know, I'm sure there must be other people in the world (laughs) that do your job. Sure, (laughs) yeah. But yeah, yeah. Do you have a network of like <laughs> intuitives who will come together? I know people, yes, for sure. I don't know of anyone who does a report in painting. I think there's some people who do some, you know, like intuitive art and things like that. I don't know of anybody who does a report, and I don't know of anyone who does things before they meet with people, not knowing anything. So I'm really proud of that process. But yeah, there are other people out there for sure. We all, you know, as I said, work differently. One of the things to be careful of, whether it's medical intuitives or psychics or anything, is people who say that they can diagnose you or even, you know, do a healing and things. I think that's something I'm skeptical of, but I am not legally or ethically able to diagnose anyone. And I can point out symptoms I'm picking up, you know, and people can verify them. And I can say, hey, if this is indeed what you are feeling, you know, I think you should get this checked out and stuff. And and I'll tell them what I see. And I'm always honest. But I think, you know, you really do have to be careful of, you know, using reputable people. Yeah, no, sure. And it sounds like you've got some like really clear boundaries there about where you're comfortable with working and where you're not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I've had my abilities verified and you know, not only by like celebrity places like Goop and stuff, but also there's an article, you know, in a peer reviewed journal that was edited by a doctor, they gave questionnaires to my clients. And then they also, we had clients who allowed me to get their medical records. And so, you know, we really, we verified what I do and my accuracy and stuff like that. But yeah, I just, and coming from, you know, a counseling perspective, I really wanted some empirical data to be able to show people. Sure. Okay. So Katie, one of the other things we wanted to focus on a bit was kind of body image. (laughs) You know, obviously, like many, many, many people in our culture suffer from poor body image. And obviously, if you have an eating disorder, that is, you know, often massively amplified and something you're really struggling with. But what are your sort of thoughts really on body image and sort of coming from the perspective that you work from? Yeah. So, I mean, and body dysmorphia, you know, as you know, which is seeing things about yourself that aren't true or exaggerating things or just focusing on, you know, a piece of cellulite or something. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I mean, guilty as charged sometimes, but it's one thing that I have learned is that we don't ever really know what we look like because even mirrors can distort images and different lighting and stuff like that. So, you know, thinking that your view of yourself is absolute, I think is something that needs to be questioned. And we're always so much harder on ourselves than we are on other people or other people are on us. And there's, I think it's sad that there's a pressure to have to weigh a certain amount or look a certain way because you see people on Instagram or celebrities or whatever. And, you know, the reality is there's a lot of airbrushing. Also, those people are often paid and incentivized to be unhealthily skinny. So that shouldn't be something that we strive for. And, you know, one of the things I had to learn too is I was convinced that people were looking at me, judging the size of my thighs. They were watching me eat and thinking that I shouldn't be eating that because that actually did happen in my dysfunctional family. Yay. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was just convinced that I was supposed to be, I don't know, that what I was was not okay. And what's fascinating to me, and we talked a little bit about me doing my pole fitness and aerial, Mm -hmm. and what I weigh now because of all the muscle I've put on, I would have been horrified, horrified to weigh when I was, you know, a teenager, I just would have thought I had to star myself and looked awful and it would have been terrifying. And now because I love my sport so much and because, you know, it is 
I know that it's muscle. So I don't get so scared about like looking at that number on the scale and being like, oh my God, yeah, I've gained 15 pounds since I started pole. It's like, I can be like, and it's funny because a lot of my clothes don't fit anymore because of the muscle and stuff, but it's really just a mindset, you know, like the number on the scale is the same, but I feel so much better about myself now than I did before. So it's not just about some number or a size, you know, or how your clothes fit. And I think comparing ourselves to other people is so unfair because like, look at it when you're in a crowd, like look at all the people, we all literally have different sizes and body shapes. And I mean, all of it. So we're just so hard on ourselves. And we don't have to be. Mm, It's so true. Yeah, we're so hard on ourselves. And I think we're all a bit overly focused on our bodies, aren't we? Because in a way, like whatever you focus on kind of expands, doesn't it, in your consciousness. And then, you know, then you're paying more attention to it. You're doing more behaviors that then amplify your thoughts and your feelings. And it's just very problematic, isn't it? Because it's very, very hard to win at as well, isn't it? When you're focusing so much on your body as a means of deriving worth or feeling good about yourself, just so hard to win. No, it's so true. And you're focusing on something in a negative fashion and that gives it so much more power. And Mm. the same happens, you know, when I work with people who are sick in some way, there's all this health anxiety and they become focused on pain or, you know, Lyme disease or whatever it is that they have. And that literally becomes their identity and they don't let themselves have fun anymore or relax or, you know, I'm going to put on a bathing suit and go swimming when I weigh a certain amount. Well, what are you doing right now? You know, Mm -hmm. like you're waiting to live and you lose sight of anything fun or all the parts of your personality. Like, you know, you are not an eating disorder. You are not pain. You are not whatever. And it just, like you said, becomes amplified in a not very good way. Hmm. So Katie, what as well are your thoughts on obviously in our youth obsessed society as women and men as well as, you know, and all genders, you know, as we become older as well, you know, we can feel more invisible, you know, maybe we kind of gain weight with age. Yeah. What are your sort of thoughts on sort of like body acceptance as one ages? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Magic tips. Right, right, right. So I'm 57. And like, I'll use poll for an example. Most of the people that I do it with are in their maybe late 20s, 30s, 40s. I'm one of the older people and no one cares. No one cares how old you are. And it's kind of fantastic. So that has been a really lovely thing. I'm friends with all of them. You know, we socialize and it doesn't matter. So that's fantastic. I remember, you know, I remember hitting 35 and my body going, wait a minute, you can't quite eat as much as you used to be able to. And then, you know, 40, and then at 50, I hit menopause and my body, the weight of my body totally went to other places where it's never been before. (laughs) So, (laughs) So I was like, okay, well, this is how it is. Now there's things you can do to help like hormone replacement and stuff like that. So that has been helpful just in terms of kind of, getting it back to where it was a little bit, not necessarily weight loss, but just proportion wise. But yeah, there's definitely an acceptance of I'm not going to look 20. I don't have to. And I think it's a balance too. like, you know, I have gray hair, but I highlight it to blend the gray, whatever. I think it really is a challenge, but it doesn't. Again, if we focus on it as something negative, then it's really going to impact how we feel and doing things that make you like feel young for lack of a better term, like, you know, exercising, hanging out with people of all ages, being creative, having fun, you know, not like not feeling like, you know, I'm like you know 57 and I don't live in a 55 and over community. I just, that's just not something that resonates with me, you know? So a lot of it is mindset, I think. Yeah, and no, it's so true, isn't it? And I always like reading about, centenarians you know people that live to 100 yeah. and, it's, um, <laughs> and it's always about isn't it like connection having a purpose 
it's not about like eating super healthily and doing you know crazy amounts of exercise or anything it's you know it's much more about moderation but it's so much more about connection relationships purpose laughing so I think it's just so important isn't it like we often just view health so much as a kind of physical thing or how we look and actually you know it's just remembering isn't it really like as we age as well focusing on that kind of broader sense of our mental well-being the things that are really important as well and help keep us young and feeling really good for sure there's a show on with Zac Efron it's called Down to Earth and it's all about like health stuff and everything so they went around the world and they went to a place where people lived over a hundred and it was this part of Italy and he was laughing because they were eating raviolis and carbs and all this stuff and he's like oh my god for like two years my trainer literally told me to have no carbs and you guys are all healthy eating as many carbs as you want (laughs) (laughs) sure I haven't watched that actually but is it on Netflix I think I've seen like the thumbnail for it (laughs) Yeah, it's really good. It's very, very good. But yeah, I just was laughing. I'm like, oh my God. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they're so true. (laughs) Yeah, they're true. Carbs are not our enemy. (laughs) (laughs) And Katie, do you have any other sort of body image tips? Like, I guess when people, because I know we talk about on the podcast a lot, and I know in the therapy room, you know, talking to clients about focusing less on their body, like broadening out other areas of life, finding meaning and purpose and deriving self-worth from, you know, multiple different areas rather than the body. But it's really hard, isn't it? When you have in the habit of focusing so much on your body, it's quite hard to sort of turn that off and start to like look at things in a different way. So I just wondered, did you have any kind of thoughts on that at all to share? Yeah, I think that movement of any kind is so incredibly important for our health, for, you know, our outlook on life, for stress reduction. And until I found pole, my whole life, except when I was a kid too, right? Movement was always connected to weight in some way. So, you know, if I didn't go to the gym, I would gain weight or, oh my God, you know, it was just in the back of my mind, it was always like this thing I had to do for my weight or a punishment or It wasn't something I really enjoyed. So it became a chore. And when I found pole, I'm like, I just love this. I really love it. I look forward to every class. I don't think about it in terms of weight. And I was like, this is the first time in my life where I've never, I've never been in such great shape. I've never moved so much. And I do it because I really love it. So I always advise people just find something to do that makes you happy, you know, that you you really love and don't, you don't have to run a marathon, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but I think movement is a wonderful way to connect to our bodies in a healthy way emotionally, because you're releasing stress. You're seeing what your body can do. Maybe you're figuring out how strong you are or doing things you never thought or, you know, whatever. So it's like, and you also, I think, you eat differently when you're moving because you're more concerned with eating for health or energy instead of thinking about like diet stuff or, you know, things like that. So I think doing things that you love is really important. I also think for me, like wearing clothes that fit you well, that you look Mm -hmm. good in instead of hanging on to clothes that don't fit you anymore and trying to get into them. And then every time you try them on, you're going to be like, Oh my God, I look awful. Buy things that fit, that look good on you, that you feel good about, you know, who cares what size it is. So I think that's really important. There's just, there's so many things, but send love to your body, just actively. Maybe when you get up in the morning, just be like, I love you. You don't, you know, just right now, like you don't have to wait. You don't have to be a certain whatever to love your body and send it love. Just kind of things like that, you know, have really been helpful to me in terms of learning to love myself no matter what I weighed or even if, you know, like if I got sick or something, you know. Yeah, no, I think some really great and inspiring tips there. I love the way as well when you're talking about movement, the fact that you're calling it movement and, you know, that's very in line with, I think, in the intuitive eating principles because right. we often think of like, 
exercise, don't we? Or, you know, and it's, you know, the whole thing about doing something that you really love and that brings you a lot of joy. And it's just kind of a whole separate thing from being connected yeah. to food. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that I consciously do not call it exercise. Consciously. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, no, such a great tip. And also, I think, again, about the wearing clothes that fit you and who cares about the size. And yeah, I just think you can have so much fun, can't you, with clothes in terms of, in a way, when you sort of throw out the need to have to conform or fit into certain things. But when you just go with your body shape and embracing perhaps color or styles that really suit you, you can be really creative and you can feel really good as well, I think, when you get more into that mindset. Yeah, it just helps your overall confidence to feel good about yourself and being, you know, close to a form of expression, you know, like you said. So Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful way of letting the world see who you are and get to know you. Yeah, brilliant. So Casey, where can people find you if they want to get hold of your book or maybe get a reading done with you or, you know, work with you? How do people find you? Yes. So the easiest place is my website. And it's katiebeecher.com. So it's B-E-E-C-H-E-R. I have a big Instagram presence. There's a lot of imposters, but it's Katie Beecher Medical Intuitive. I'm on Facebook, you know, all the social media things. And you can get my book on Amazon or basically wherever. It's in audio and regular, like hardcover and softcover. I recommend if you can getting the paper version because there's a lot of charts and quizzes and tools and visuals and things like that that are easier to see than to hear. Like a lot of people buy the audio and then also buy the book book to accompany it because there's a lot of, it's designed to kind of be a reference that you refer back to all the time. And, you know, you do the work kind of throughout it. So it's easier to see it. But yeah, it's, I'm everywhere. So yeah, they're brilliant. And are you the reader on your audio book? I am. I am. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. What, what was it like reading your book? Was it a satisfying experience? It was weird. I had to record in a closet. So they, <laughs> McMillan sent me all the equipment and you have to be in like a really, not necessarily small place, but a really quiet space. So we emptied out one of the, you know, walking closets and set up in there and it went more smoothly than I thought. So I didn't, you know, I thought, oh my God, I can barely walk and chew chew gum. So this should be interesting. But yeah, it was actually enjoyable. The people that I, you know, did it with are super nice. And so, yeah, it was fun. They actually asked me to do it after hearing me on a few podcasts. So I was like, really? (laughs) So it was kind of nice. It was a nice confidence builder. Yeah, they're brilliant. Well, they're good for you. (laughs) Because I can imagine it. I was like, you want to do what? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, Katie, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I think it's just been really so helpful to hear, you know, more about your story, to hear about the work you do. I think there've been so many inspirational tips to take away, you know, just really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I'm glad that you, you said, you know, got my book and liked it. And that was really nice. And, and all that. And thank you for having me on again. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Katie. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all of Katie's details in the show notes. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. Just to say that if you are looking for individual therapy, I do have quite a long waiting list at the moment. So just to kind of flag that in advance. But if you're looking for a really great insight into how I work and you like online learning, I have a course, 10 Steps to Intuitive Eating. I've got 50% off at the moment. All the details are on my website. And it's a great way to really engage with sort of the way that I work. There's lots of really helpful videos, lots of lectures with reflective questions for you to really start on your own healing journey. So I would really recommend going have a look at that and you can have a kind of quite a good overview before you actually sign up and see if you think it's for you. And if you've got any questions, do just drop me an email, harry.fru at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate everyone that supports this podcast and all the really, really lovely messages I get. 
And if you do enjoy the podcast, I'd be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review because it does help it reach so many more listeners. Wow, that was a bit of a long outro, if that's what you call it. Anyway, thank you again for listening and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.